Uh, how many of you, when you were growing up, uh, I had one of these, had a little toy. They had a picture of a, a very attractive guy on it named Wooly Willie. You remember this guy? You know? And you would take the little magnetic pin and you would move, you know, move the magnet pieces, the little pieces around to give him hair and stuff like that. I mean, personally, I think he's already pretty good looking. Um, <laughs> I don't really know why we need to move hair around or anything like that. But, uh, you know, one of my favorite things to do was to put hair growing out of his ears, you know, and just, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we'd put, we'd try to do eyebrows. I tried to do a flat top one time and just couldn't quite get it, you know, flat enough. But, uh, man, we, we used to have fun. You know, toys today are so complicated. But, you know, just throw some magnets and some uh, metal shavings together and you got a great toy, Right. I mean, isn't that, isn't that what you should, uh, we should be letting the kids play with these days? Magnets and metal shavings. Um, uh, but anyway, you know, Wooly Wooly was, was a fun toy just to kind of mess around with. But it does remind us of the power of, of, of magnets. And, and Brother David titled this message today, The Magnetism of the Cross, because really magnets have different types of effects on different objects. Um, one of the things that Melody probably regrets getting from me um, one, uh, is something she got from me many years ago, and it's these two little magnetic uh, metal balls. And you know, they're supposed to be like stress balls where you kind of roll them around in your hand, you know, and, and they stay together, but they'll kind of turn or whatever. But I figured out that if you put them in your hands and kind of spread them out and throw them up in the air, that they, they hit together and make this really loud clacking noise. You know, that's just what she needed to do is give a 10-year-old metal, you know, something that makes noise. Um, and that's basically what she did when she gave those to me. And so I, I have, I've worn those things out on the little metal ball. It's got like a little, you know, shiny covering where those things clack together. I've literally worn the covering out on those balls because uh, I've used them so much. And so um, I don't play with them anymore uh, for the sake of the sanity in our house. Uh, but, you know, with those... Uh, the, the, the magnetism always draws it back to one spot, okay, because that, that's where the, the poles are opposite, and so it makes it draw to that one spot. But if I was to somehow turn them around, they would, be, they would repel each other. You know, so a magnet, if you put the two positive ends together, it, it repels each other. It's hard to kind of, you know, get them to match up or get them to touch each other, especially if you have really strong magnets. They, they repel each other. Um, but then if you put them where it's positive and negative, they're attracted to one another, right? And so there's a certain way where a, a magnet repels itself, or there's a certain way where a magnet attracts something. But there's also a, a principle about magnetism where it has no effect on anything whatsoever. For example, if I was to hold a magnet up to this piece of paper, would it do anything? No, the piece of paper would just, it would just fall, right? There's no magnetism with a piece of paper or with a piece of plastic or with a, a piece of wood or something like that. And so there's a certain aspect where a magnet will repel something, a certain aspect where a magnet will attract something, and sometimes it has, uh, does nothing to it whatsoever. Well, there's a very similar, there's a similarity to the message of the cross. You know, sometimes the message of the cross repels people. They don't want to hear about a bloody cross. They don't want to hear about a God who came to earth and who lived a perfect life and then gave his life as a sacrifice for a lost humanity. And and, you know, there's certain churches that don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ because they think it is, it's gruesome and it would turn people away. But, you know, the Scripture says that without blood, there is no, uh, there's no forgiveness of sin. It is the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses us, which washes over us and, and forgives us of that sin. And so the, the message of the cross sometimes repels people. Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul writes that preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. There's some people where the message of the cross has no effect on them whatsoever. It doesn't repel them. It doesn't uh, attract them. They just kind of are apathetic towards it. Uh, the, one of the primary growing groups of people in our country today are what uh, religious statisticians call the nuns. They're not affiliated with any kind of religious group. They're not, they're not Christian. They're not uh, Muslim. They're not Jehovah's Witness. They're not Hindu, Buddhist. They're, they have no religious affiliation whatsoever. There's a segment of that group which uh, some people call the duns. They're people who used to be connected to a church, but they've gotten burned in one way or another. And so they just decided they've had enough of church. They don't need anything. They're done with church. They're done with Christianity. 
And so they have no attraction and no, uh, you know, really concerned with Christianity whatsoever. But thankfully, there's millions of people around the world who are very attracted to the message of the gospel. Uh, and this is a truth that's taking place all around the world. And sadly, we don't see it a whole lot here in the United States. In the United States, Christianity is growing very, very, very slowly. But there are other parts of the world where people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ in very, in very great numbers and in powerful ways. And there is just an openness to the gospel and the harvest, like Jesus described it in the, in the gospel. The harvest, uh, the fields are white and a harvest, and they're just waiting and begging for laborers to go out into the fields. And so these people are being attracted to the message of Jesus Christ. And so we need to realize that we're going to come into contact with all these different types of people. And even in this room today, there may be some of you who are repelled by the message of the cross. There may be some of you who are just, you don't really care. You know what, you came because uh, you had to come with a family member or a spouse or uh, parents or something like that. But you really don't care about the message of the cross one way or another. But hopefully, if you're in one of those categories, or maybe you're already in the third category, we can move to that category of being attracted to the message of the gospel and realize what the cross means for us. And so let's talk about, uh, let's, just, let's look at this, this passage we have today. We're in John chapter 12. I uh, should have mentioned that earlier. Um, John chapter 12, and we'll begin in verse 27. And so just remember that this passage of Scripture, you know, all the, we're only about halfway, a little bit past halfway through the Gospel of John, but the entire rest of the Gospel of John takes place in just a few days. It's that the whole second half of this Gospel takes place uh, in, the, in the middle of Passion Week, all the way up to the cross and the resurrection. And so this is, this is really expanding out uh, the, the communication of Jesus. And even though this is going to probably take us a year or more to get through this passage of Scripture, just remember that this is leading up to the cross. We're just a few days away from the cross, okay? So John chapter 12, if you'd like to stand for the reading of God's word, you can. If you can't stand, that's fine. Just sit and read with us. John 12, starting in verse 27. Jesus says, Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. To myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus answered, The light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness does not overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. Jesus said this, then went away. And hid from them. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are so thankful this morning to be able to study your scripture. And Lord, to understand that Jesus has come for us to draw us to him. And so Lord, as we look at these responses to the cross today, I pray that you would help us to understand that the cross was not meant to push us away. And the cross was not meant to, for us just to be apathetic towards, but the cross was really designed to draw us to Jesus. And it does, in fact, draw us to Jesus. So I pray that you'd help us understand that this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. So am I using this mic now? or? All right. I guess I'm going handheld mic now. So you know what? Uh, I've always said that Satan loves technology. <laughs> That's where he likes to hang out, right? And, uh, but anyway, he's not going to have the victory today. And so, uh, you know, what is interesting, just, just yesterday, Brother David flew in from Israel, uh, and uh, he, he takes a, a group every year to, to go to Israel, and he got back just yesterday, and, and a few years, Melody and I had the opportunity to go with him, and I tell you what, it's just a life-changing opportunity. If you ever get the chance to go to Israel, I'd encourage you to go. Um, it'll, uh, it will enlighten your faith. That's, that's what I like to tell people. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily establish your faith. It doesn't uh, give you faith, but it will really enlighten your faith. Uh, just like 
You know, sometimes going to a Civil War battlefield can really help your understanding of how a Civil War battle took place or a revolutionary battle. Or if you go and, and visit Pearl Harbor or something or a battleship somewhere, you can really understand what it's like in that kind of scenario because you're walking where those people walked. And um, as you go to, to Israel, and if you go on one of these trips, you most likely you'll go to the Garden Tomb. And, and the Garden Tomb is uh, there. It's just kind of just outside of Israel. And uh, a lot of people believe that that's where Jesus was buried. Now, there's, there's a church inside of Jerusalem called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that's where historically people thought the burial place of Jesus was because Constantine's mother had a vision and, and said that that's where it was. And that's where people believed it was for centuries uh, but just in the last uh, few few uh, centuries, people have begun to, to believe that maybe this garden tomb is where Jesus uh, was buried. And, and part of the reason is that um, back uh, a long time ago, um, there was a, uh, back in the 1800s, uh, a guy named Horatio G. Spafford, he wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul, was sitting in the American hotel there in Jerusalem, just kind of looking down the road. And he realized that this hillside he was looking at looked like a skull. And so he uh, and another guy named Charles Gordon wound up buying that property and began clearing it out, clearing around some of the, some of the debris and some of the, the growth that had grown there. And this is what that place looked like, the, the, called the Place of the Skull, uh, that hillside around the turn of the, of the century, around 1900 and late 1800s. And you can, you can really see right there that skull, those two eyes and a mouth right there and uh, it's not near as visible now because of pollution and because of vandalism. Uh, the uh, Muslims tend to really try to vandalize that area. But what was interesting is they started clearing out around this hillside. They found a garden. And in this garden area is a cistern where they would have pressed grapes. And, and there was other stones and stuff to indicate there was a garden. And inside the hillside, just to, uh, just to this side of the place of the skull, was a tomb carved out of the rock. And um, the tomb was a three-chambered tomb, indicating that it was been owned by a rich man. And so as you, as you read through the Gospels, you see that Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, or Calvary, which means the place of the skull. And that just near there, he was then taken down and placed in a rich man's tomb that was placed in a garden. So a lot of people believe that this is where it took place. But, you know, you look at that hill, and we think about the song, the old rugged cross, which says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And you can almost picture there on that hillside, Jesus' crosses uh, as, and, and the cross of, the, of the, the criminals that he was crucified with. And um, there's a road that runs by this place, which was a very uh, well-traveled road. And so it's likely the place where Jesus would have been crucified. And so we're talking about this old rugged cross today. And as you think about that hill of, of Golgotha and the garden tomb, you can think about how Jesus hung on that cross and how he also rose again from the dead. And I want to talk about three things that happened here at the cross. Um, and we're going to talk about three different directions that, that kind of uh, help these things come about. Talking about out, up, and to. Someone went out, someone else went up, and finally someone else went to. And so the first thing that we can see is that Satan is being cast out. Jesus said, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. He said that there in, in the passage that we, uh, that we just read. He said that um, in uh, verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And so Satan is being cast out. And this is something that doesn't happen all at once. This, the, the language here means that it's something that is happening as an ongoing process. From the first time that Satan slid into the garden and began giving his lies to Adam and to Eve, and they fell victim to those lies, he, is, he has been called the prince of this world. He is somebody who is trying to entrap mankind and to pull mankind away from God. And that's really Satan's desire. He wants to pull us away from loyalty to God or from understanding who God is. And his, his number one lie that Satan will tell you over and over and over is that you can do it on your own, that you don't need God. You know, we just sang a song earlier that says what? It says, God is able. And Satan says, well, who cares? Because you're able too. He says, you don't need God. God's trying to hold out on you. And if you'll pursue your own direction, your own desires, and your own ways of life, you'll be so much more satisfied. But if you're like me, you know, you've, you've probably tasted that fruit before, right? 
And does it leave you satisfied? No. Every single time, it leaves you empty. It leaves you needing something else. There's only one thing that is able to fill that emptiness, and that is God. Satan's ultimate goal was to destroy God's Redeemer, Jesus, and by destroying Jesus, to destroy hope for mankind. He tried by tempting in the wilderness, and he failed. He tried by manipulating the Jewish leaders to go against Jesus and to develop a hatred for Jesus and ultimately to kill Jesus. And I assume that as Jesus hung there on that cross with nails in his hands and nails in his feet, Satan was probably pumping his fist thinking he had won the victory. But oh, Satan, man, he was wrong, right? Because it may be Friday now, but Sunday was coming. And on Sunday, Jesus rose from that grave. He conquered over death and he conquered over Satan. And he's not in that tomb anymore. And so Jesus had a totally different perspective on the cross. He didn't think that he had lost a battle. But Jesus knew that whenever he was lifted up, that the judgment of the world was coming and the ruler of the world would be cast out. And he said in verse 32, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus knew what the mission of the cross was. And so at the, at the cross, Jesus disarmed Satan of his two most powerful weapons. The first weapon is guilt. Have you ever felt the guilt of your sin? You know, there's two different things that we will often feel whenever we have sin in our life. One of those is conviction, and conviction comes by the Holy Spirit, right? Conviction is when the Holy Spirit says, hey, Dustin, you don't need to be doing that. That's, that's something that, that harms the heart of God. That's something that breaks that relationship with God. And so that's not God's best for your life. So conviction draws you back to the heart of God. It's just like whenever your child uh, you know, does something they're not supposed to do and, and it breaks your heart. And you, what you don't do is you don't just try to pour guilt on them, make them feel bad about themselves. A good parent draws that child in and says, hey, this hurts my heart and this hurts God's heart, but there's forgiveness on the other side. And that's the goal of conviction. But Satan's tool is guilt. He just heaps it on you. He says, hey, you messed up this time, and you'll probably mess up again. You're worthless. Nobody would want you as their son. Nobody would want you as their daughter, and certainly not the God of the universe. You need to just hide this sin and just try to cover over your shame. Where Jesus says, no, bring your sin, bring your guilt, bring your shame to me, and I'll cover over it with the blood of my sacrifice. And so at the cross, Jesus disarmed guilt. At the cross, he paid for the forgiveness that we need. Satan's second weapon is fear. You know, Satan likes to put that fear into you. Maybe it's the fear of being caught. Maybe it's the fear of being known by others and known how sinful you are. Maybe it's the fear of the unknown, or maybe it's the fear that God would let you down at some point. And so you try to depend on yourself. But Jesus un. Uh, he, he took that fear away at the cross. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. It says that Jesus destroyed the one holding the power of death, the devil, to free us from the fear of death. Do you realize what that word means, to, to destroy something? You know, whenever you, uh, I looked it up, and it, it basically means to make it utterly useless or to, to, for it to lose its ultimate purpose. For something to be destroyed means that you remove its ability to perform its task. We were, we were talking, I was talking to the kids about this last night, and, you know, whenever something is destroyed, it can be in a state of destruction but still maintain some of its functionality, right? How many of you have, well, I won't make you raise your hand. But you just, you just think, have you ever totaled a car? Okay. Now, for those of you who have totaled a car, or maybe you know somebody else who has totaled a car, you know, a total, totaled car can still maintain some of its functionality, right? The power may still come on. Who knows? The engine might even crank, depending on how it was wrecked. Uh, you might could still get a wheel to turn or something like that. Maybe you could still make the radio play, you know? A totaled car, a car that is destroyed, may still have some functionality, but it's still on its way out, right? It's totaled. Well, at the cross, Jesus totaled Satan. He destroyed Satan. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan still doesn't maintain some of his functionality. He can still try to take you down with him. He's still got some, tr some tricks up his sleeve. He's still got some weapons that he can wield. But there's coming a day where Satan's going to be taken to the junkyard. He's going to be put out 
with the rest of total humanity and total, his angels that he tricked into following him, and he will be utterly destroyed. He will be cast into the lake of fire. Just like a total car, one day is going to go to the salvage yard, it's going to be crushed, it's going to be melted down, it's going to be used to make something new. Well, Satan's going to be melted down, but he's not going to be used to make anything new. He's going to be destroyed forever. And that's the truth of the cross, is that God has, through Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice on the cross, he has destroyed Satan. You know, in the 1970s, Hal Lindsey wrote a book called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. Well, you know, that might have been an interesting book, but the title is way off. <laughs> Because Satan is not alive and well. He's alive and he's destroyed. Revelation 20.10 talks about the future of him. It says, the, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. And so the first truth that we can see, the magnetism of the cross, is that it repels Satan. Satan is being cast out. The second thing that we see is that the Savior was lifted up. Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the earth, he says, verse 32, as for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. You know, as John kind of gives us a little parenthetical statement there right after that, he says, he said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. You know, Jesus knew that in just a few days he was going to be nailed to a cross and lifted up from the earth, that he would be crucified for the sake of all humanity. You have to remember that at this point, the disciples still had no clue. They had no clue that this was about to happen. Jesus had been giving them hints about it along the way, but they were still clueless. Even up to the point of him being arrested, they were still clueless as to what was about to happen. But Jesus said this to leave no doubt that he knew he would be nailed to a cross in just a matter of days. And it reminds us of what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Remember, Nicodemus was a religious Jew. Um, he was part of the religious elite, yet he at least has a, enough humility to come to Jesus, even under the cover of night, to ask him questions about what it meant to have faith. Like, what was Jesus' message? What was his whole purpose? And Jesus said this in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And as Jesus said this, he was referring to a story in Numbers chapter 21, which Nicodemus as a religious elite would have known. I mean, he was a religious scholar. He knew the Old Testament law like the, uh, you know, like, like he read it every single day. He knew it frontwards and backwards. And so he would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. This story in Numbers 21 where the Israelites had sinned against God. And so God sent snakes all through their camp and the snakes were biting people, and they, these people were dying because of the snake bites. And so they cried out to Moses and the God, help us, save us. And so God said to Moses, fashion a snake out of bronze, put it on a pole, and lift it up. He said, anyone who is bit by a snake, they can go and they can look at that snake on a pole. And if they will look at the snake, they will be healed. And so Jesus used this imagery to describe how he would be lifted up from the earth and how his being lifted up would be an opportunity for people to be healed from that which was killing them, that spiritual death that they were going through. And so think about the instructions that God gave Moses and the Israelites. God didn't say, if you will bow down and worship the snake, you will be healed. He didn't say, if you come and give an offering of money, to the snake, you will be healed. He didn't even say, if you come and sacrifice something, sacrifice an animal of some kind, you will be healed. What was the only thing that you had to do in order to look at that snake and or to, to be healed from your snake bite? You just had to look at it. You just had to exhibit faith that what God said he would do, he would do. And as you looked upon that snake, there was nothing magical about the snake. There wasn't some hocus pocus about the snake. The, the snake didn't blow you a healing kiss or anything like that. I mean, there's nothing weird about the snake. It was just a bronze snake. Where the healing took place was the faith that it took to look at the snake. Because you might be on the other side of the camp when you get snake bit. You got to walk over to the snake and you got to look at it. You know, you might be over there thinking, well, I'm not going to walk all the way over there and look at a dumb bronze snake. Bronze snake can't do anything. I'm going to go over here to the doctor instead. He's got more of a chance of healing me than a stupid statue. Well, see, the power wasn't in the statue. The power was in the Word of God and the faith that it took to believe in the Word of God. And so whenever Jesus says 
that just as the snake in the wilderness was lifted up, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then he says that same thing in verse 32. As for me, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. The answer is to look at Jesus and to live. And that's the same message to us today. If we want to receive salvation, it's not being better, being a, I'll, I'll put it this way, being a gooder person. Okay, you, write that, you might want to write that down. You got me, Glenn? You got me? All right. It's not about being a gooder person, okay? Being gooder doesn't do you any good. Man, I'm just coming up with these just like off the top of my head, you know? Being gooder doesn't do you any good, okay? It's all about looking to Jesus. Jesus is the, is the focal point of our salvation. It doesn't matter how many times you come to church. It doesn't matter uh, how, if your parents were Christians or if your grandparents were Christians. It doesn't matter what church you go to. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're buried in the church cemetery. All those things don't get you into heaven. All those things don't get you a restored relationship with God the Father. It's only looking at Jesus in faith to come to him, to be drawn to him, to look to him. That is where salvation takes place because it's about faith. And as Jesus was lifted up on that that cross, it's a reminder and and it's really an interesting parallel between the snake. Remember, the snake was the thing that was going through the camp and it was biting people and killing them. That that snake was the problem, right? And so God said, well, hey, make make an image of the problem and put it up on a pole. And anybody who looks to that will receive healing. We know... Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be made sin for us so that in him we might uh, become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus said, whenever I am lifted up, I'm going to become sin. And anybody who looks at the cross and sees what sin has done to me and how I've become sin on their behalf, and if they look to me in faith, they're going to see that their sin now is on the cross because I'm bearing the sin of the world. And so Jesus became our sin. He put our sin on the cross. And if we look to him in faith, we will have forgiveness. He became the problem that we were facing. He took sin on our behalf. And so Satan has been casted out. The Savior has been lifted up. And then the third thing that we see in this passage of Scripture, the magnetism of the cross, is that sinners are drawn to him. Sinners are drawn to Jesus. Jesus said, I will draw all people to myself. Now, there are some people that take this passage of Scripture and they say that this means that in the end, everybody will be saved. They, they take this as a universalism type principle, that Jesus is saying he will draw all men to himself means that, look, it doesn't matter if you uh, believe in Jesus whenever you're alive. Ultimately, Jesus is going to save everybody. It doesn't matter if you were a Muslim. It doesn't matter if you were a Hindu or if you were a Buddhist. It doesn't matter if you were one of the nuns or if you were one of the duns. Jesus is ultimately going to draw everybody to him in salvation. But that's not what the whole message of the gospel is. Jesus is very clear that there's going to come a time where he comes back and his angels that come with him separate the sheep from the goats. Those who have believed will be separated out from those who have not believed in him. So the gospel, the overall message of the gospel is very clear that it does take faith in Jesus Christ to receive the forgiveness of your sins and to receive salvation, to receive eternal life. So what does this word mean? But when Jesus says, I will draw all people to myself, he doesn't mean all individual people. He means that he will draw all kinds of people to himself. If we look up in uh, verse 20, we can kind of see why he might say that in this setting. In John chapter 12, verse 20, it says, Now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And then verse 23 says, Jesus replied to them, and then he began talking. He said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And so this is all a part of that same message. And that's why Jesus says there in uh, verse 27, Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that's why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And so Jesus starts this whole section of Scripture that we're reading based on some Greek people, some Gentiles, some non-Jewish people coming to his disciples and saying, hey, we want to see Jesus. Can we talk to Jesus? And so Jesus begins talking about what this means. And then he says, 
I will draw all people to myself. Meaning, I will draw Jews to myself, but I will also draw Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to myself. So is it any, any wonder that this passage of Scripture ends with, Jesus said this and then went away and hid from them? Because he had just made the, the, the Jewish people mad again. <laughs> he had just let the Jewish people know that the, the hope of the gospel, the hope of their God, Yahweh, was not just for the Jews. It was for all kinds of people. So when Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. He's meaning all kinds of people. This word is not just for the Jewish people. This word is for everybody. And aren't you glad it is? Because when I look around, I see primarily a bunch of Gentiles. You know, there may be some of you in here that have some Jewish background that I'm not aware of. But when I look around, I see a whole lot of Gentiles. So, and I'm a Gentile. And I'm so thankful that the message of the gospel is not just for the Jews. I'm so thankful that the word of God, the word of the gospel, and the hope of the gospel came through the Jewish people, just like God promised, but it was made available to all nations, to all ethnic groups. And that's why in Revelation 7, we read that there is going to be a group of people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue will be gathered at the throne of the Savior. Jesus' followers come from all different nations and all languages, which makes him very unique. You know, out of Abraham, if you trace your way all the way back to Abraham, there are three primary religious groups that come out of Abraham. There's Christianity that we're a part of. There's the faith of Islam that traces its roots all the way back to Abraham. And then there's the Jewish faith that traces their roots all the way back to Abraham. In Islam, in order to be a, a good Muslim, in order to be a good follower of the Quran, you have to know Arabic. Because in order to be a true uh, Muslim, in order to be somebody who is truly faithful to the Islamic faith, you have to be able to read the Quran in Arabic. If you read it in English, well, that's okay, but it, it, you're not as good a Muslim as if you read it in Arabic. True uh, Muslims must read the Quran in Arabic. It's the same way with the Jewish people. If you want to know the Torah, and if you want to really study the Torah and consider yourself a good uh, Jewish person, you have to be able to read the Torah in Hebrew. In order to go through um, for, for really zealous Jews, in order to go through your bar mitzvah or your bat mitzvah as a 13-year-old kid, you have to be able to read the Torah in Hebrew. But the scripture, the truth of Christianity is that there's going to be people of every tribe, people of every nation, people of every language coming together and making one choir. Gary, how would you like to lead that choir? I mean, trying to get them, them all saying, in the, you wouldn't know if they were saying the right words or not, right? But God will. Because God knows every language. He created every language. And there's going to come a point where we all gather around the throne of God, people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and worship God. And so there's no central language, but there is a drawing of the magnetism of the cross that is drawing all kinds of people to Jesus. And that truth is that there's, a, there's the work of the Holy Spirit. There's two types of drawing that are, that are taking place. There's going to come a point where everybody has to come to Jesus and acknowledge that he's Lord. Philippians tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess in heaven, uh, uh, on the earth and under the earth, that Jesus is Lord. There's going to come a day where everybody is gathered around Jesus and either by will or by compulsion, they acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of all. There's also a sense where the Holy Spirit is drawing these people to him. John 6, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the truth of the magnetism of the cross is that God is still in the business of drawing people to him. And today, maybe you feel that drawing. You feel God drawing you to him. It could be in the first point of salvation. You've never given your life to Christ and God is drawing you today. Or it could be that you have been straying away from God and that he's drawing you back today. You know, the, the message of that song that we talked about, the old rugged cross, there's another verse. In the second verse, it says, Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction to me. You know, Jesus draws, him, draws us to himself in a lot of different ways. Uh, this year, 2020, I'll be 40 years old. I know, I know. My hair is getting gray. Can you all tell? Yeah, that's why, that's why I just keep it cut short, you know. But I'll be 40 years old this year, okay? I mean, I'm getting old, guys. I'm getting, I'm getting on up there, 40 years old. 
It's because I was born on October the 15th, 1980. But on July, in July 1993, actually 1994, in July 1994, that's the year that I was born again. And I remember fighting that for a long time because I thought that I was already a believer. Whenever I was six years old, I was at a revival, and it was on Friday. You remember when revivals went all week long? Y'all remember that? And uh, it was Friday of this revival. I was six years old, and I thought I was so confused. I'd been listening to this revival this whole week, and I just didn't quite understand. But I thought you had to get saved to revival. You couldn't get saved anywhere else, right? And so I thought, it's Friday. I have to get saved. And so I went down. I, I prayed a prayer. I was baptized, but I didn't understand what was going on. It wasn't until I was 13 years old that really God began working in my heart. And I began realizing that I had made a decision not based on understanding, but based on like compulsion. I felt like this was something I had to do. And it wasn't until I was 13 that I really felt God drawing my heart to him. And I fought it for a long time because I thought, I'm already saved. I've already done that. I've already been baptized. What will my parents think if I have to do this all over again? And I'm Baptist. We only get baptized one time, you know. And so I thought, well, this is, you know, I just, I fought it for a long time. And finally, at youth camp, at Centrifuge Youth Camp at Union University in Tennessee, I finally gave up on a Wednesday. I saw my youth pastor walking by. I ran over to him. We knelt down on the ground right by the tennis courts there at that university. And I gave my life to Christ because the Holy Spirit was drawing me. He just kept working on my heart and kept working on my heart. You know, what was really neat is that that evening, as we had our wrap-up time for our youth group, I my, my youth pastor, Bobby, said, I want you to share, you know, Dustin, will you share what happened today? And so I got up and I shared that story and said, I've been fighting it for a long time, but I finally gave up and I gave my life to Christ today. And right there in that meeting, when I got done talking, two boys, I was a, I was a middle schooler, two upperclassmen guys in our youth group stood up and said they wanted to do the same thing because they had been feeling the drawing of the Spirit. But they were embarrassed because they were older and they'd already done that earlier in life and they didn't know what people would think. If all of a sudden they, decide, they said, well, I've been playing a game all this time, but now I really want to give my life to Christ. But it turned out to be a really cool situation as we all got to share that testimony. And then as we all got to share that story with our church as we got back and reported, and then as we all three got to be baptized together. And so I, sh I share that story because there may be somebody in this room who's been playing a game. Maybe you've been playing a game for years because people think that you're a Christian and, and they've seen you in church your whole life, and, and it would be embarrassing for you to admit that you've been playing a game all this time. Listen, I've, told, I've heard stories of deacon chairmen who got saved whenever they were 60 years old. I've heard stories of pastor's wives who got saved. after they, They'd been serving with their husbands for ministry for many, many years. Listen, I've even heard of preachers who got saved by their own preaching. <laughs> And listen, if, if, if a pastor can admit that he's been playing a game for that many years and then come before his church and give his life to Christ, then you can too. So you may have been playing a game for years. I want to invite you to the cross today. Hopefully that magnetism of the cross is drawing you to it today. And whether you're young or whether you're old or somewhere in between, if the cross is drawing you today, give your life to Christ today. Don't put it off another day. Don't put it off another week or a month or a year because none of us are promised that. The truth of the gospel is that Jesus is calling us today. And I want to leave you with this tr important truth, is that you have a limited opportunity to respond to God's offer of salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 12, The light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. You know, if you watch TV anytime, you're going to see an infomercial, right? And it's going to say, Hurry, this offer is only available for a limited time. Limited time only. Today, order today, and we'll, we'll, triple, your, you know, we'll triple your order. Well, listen, the, the offer of Jesus Christ is an ongoing offer, but your time to accept that offer is limited. You're not promised another day. You're not promised another week or month or even a year. And so as, if Christ is drawing you today, I want to ask you to respond to him in faith. And if you're a believer already, and you know that without a doubt, but maybe you've been wandering away from Christ, I want to invite you to, to renew that relationship today, to come back to Christ. Remember, the, the message of the gospel is not just a message for the point of salvation. Remember, we talked about in Sunday school, if you were in Sunday school this morning, we talked about how Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the righteous will live by 
faith. The truth of the gospel is that we need the gospel every single day of our lives because we have to live in the power of what Jesus has done in our life. And so if you're a believer today and maybe you've been wandering away, I want to invite you back to the gospel, to that life-changing message that Jesus has taken away your sin and has, wants to restore in your relationship to the Father. And so like we've been doing in our invitation times for the last few weeks, and as we continue this same uh, thing that we've been doing all the way up through Palm Sunday, we're going to spend some time in prayer today. And I'm going to ask you just to pray there at your seat. I'm going to invite our, 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 our musicians to go ahead and come up and, and get in place and prepare for our invitation time. Because the goal of this time is for us today, for us just to evaluate ourselves. E- evaluate any kind of wrong thinking that might be in our hearts. Evaluate uh, a decision that we might need to make for the Lord. And I'm just going to invite you to today, I'm I'm not really going to prompt you a whole lot today. I just want you to spend some time praying to the Lord, asking God to reveal anything in your life that you need to do business with Him about. All right. I'm just going to have you sit and pray as our musicians play. But today we are going to break a little bit of what we've been doing. And if you need to make a decision today for the Lord, if you need to give your life to Him, uh, if you need to maybe recommit your life to Him, or if you just need me to pray with you, I will be here at the front. And you're free, just like you are every Sunday, you're free to come and talk with me about that. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to just enter into a time of prayer as our musicians play. Lord God, we thank You that You are the God who is able. And that as Jesus went to the cross... Lord, we know that that cross sometimes repels people. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. And Lord, today it may seem like foolishness to some people in this room, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them of that thinking. And that they'll reevaluate the conclusions that they've made about Jesus. They'll reevaluate the conclusions they've made about the cross. And they'll realize that the cross isn't foolishness, Lord. The cross is a beautiful gift. That through the painful sacrifice of Jesus, he offers salvation to those who are lost. And so, Lord, I pray that you would draw somebody to yourself today. And that they would respond by recognizing that they're a sinner in need of salvation. That they can't save themselves, but there is only one way to receive salvation. That is by looking to Jesus on the cross. By looking and realizing that he took all their sin on the cross on himself. He forgave their sin, and if they respond in faith by giving their life to Him and letting Him be Lord and Savior of their life, that they will receive forgiveness, they'll have a restored relationship with you. And just like Jesus didn't stay on that cross, but whenever He died, He resurrected to, uh, to new life, Lord, that we can be resurrected to new life. That although we die physically, if we believe in Jesus, we'll never die spiritually. We'll have eternal life. So God, I pray that if there's anybody that needs to receive that by faith today, they'll do it today. Lord, if there's anybody that needs to renew their life today, I pray that they'll renew it by the power of the gospel. So God, as we pray, would you hear our prayers? Would you help us to know what to pray? Would you just move in our hearts? So I just want to encourage you now, congregation, to spend some time in prayer. Ask God if there's anything in your life that needs to be removed. Ask God of what it is that you need to do in order to turn to Him. And if you need to give your life to Christ today for the very first time, then I would like to talk with you about that. So as our musicians play, would you pray?